Well, I want to welcome all of you again, and I'm so glad that you have joined us today. I'm sharing our Connect Group Gathering. It's, it's a new series that I've begun. We do this once a year, every year, and you may be new to us, and you're wondering, what are our Connect Groups and these gatherings? Well, really, they're just our small groups that meet in homes or cafes, wherever, at a time that is best for you and a few of your friends. And so we hope that all of you will become a part of one of those groups. I promise you, if you make the effort and you go consistently and regularly, you will be glad you did. You will, you will, you will grow some new friends and you'll be able to help people. Uh, and if you're, you ever come to a time in your life where you need a little someone to reach in, you'll have built some relationships and it is well worth it. Amen? Well, the new series that we're in, I've entitled Be Prepared. Be prepared. I'm sharing five survival strategies for the crazy days ahead. Now, we've established already in this series, uh, we, we've taken some kind of some hand votes here, and uh, it's, it's almost 100% agree uh, that we are living in some very, very crazy times. Amen? Some would even go so far as to say, and I'm probably in that camp, don't let this horrify you, I believe we've entered into what the Bible calls the last days. Now, in fact, did you know the last days began 2,000 years ago? So don't, don't, don't get all rattled or shaken. You know, I, I didn't know until I started this series, people nowadays, if you mention the last days, they kind of get all freaked out and they're like, I don't want to hear that. I've got enough hassles in my life. I've got enough burdens. And so, well, I'm here to tell you the truth. It's just what I think and it's what I believe. And so what I've been doing just simply... Uh, to have a little fun, and for illustration's sake, uh, I, I've been saying it this way. If you're in a survival situation, and you have a few basic items, and just a little know-how, you can get through uh, this time very, very successfully. How many of you agree that, that these times are a bit challenging? They really are, but we're going to get through them well. And, and we've already used one of the illustrations, for example, you need a compass. What does a compass do? A compass keeps you pointed in the right direction so that you don't get lost. We talked about that in lesson one. And then next, we talked about water in lesson number two, or actually I think that was number three, and we did that last time. How many of you know you have to have water to survive? It is the most important nutrient that your body has to have in order for you to live. You don't only need it, you have to have it. But today I want to talk to you about shelter shelter thus the tent on the stage when you're in a survival situation one of the first things you need is shelter why do you need shelter because shelter protects us from the elements and from danger if you get caught in a rainstorm and you're out in a wilderness having some shelter is a really good thing now you also need some fire. We're going to talk about that next week. You need some food. Everybody say, oh yeah, you need some food, amen. You need some food. You need a few tools, and if you have those, you can survive any situation. So here is the spiritual application to this aspect of, of shelter. Here it is. You may want to turn to Psalm 91. We're going to spend the rest of the, this morning in Psalm 91. Absolutely one of my favorite psalms. I live by this psalm. I live in this psalm. Psalm 91, verse 1. I want to read this first verse, and I'll pray while you're turning there or clicking there. It says, Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. While you're turning there, I'm going to pray for us. Father, we want to thank you, Father, that there's not one person within the sound of my voice, Lord, those within this room, Lord, those who are watching online, those who will see this later on our, 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 our web page, Lord. God, we pray that you will open our eyes, that we will understand that you do not want us to live in fear, but in absolute confidence that you've got us. You've got us in the palm of your hand, and everything is going to be okay, and that we don't have to be afraid or worry about anything if we will live in the shelter of the Most High. Teach us how to do that today, I pray in Jesus' name. Now, here's what I believe. I believe that there is a place of safety and protection for God's children regardless of 
all the craziness going on. Now, some have referred to the 91st Psalm as the Christian's insurance policy or coverage. And by the way, I want every one of you, I have written you, actually I copied this from something I've had for years and years and years. This is the Christian uh, uh, God's insurance policy. We put some of those in the four-year areas. I want every one of you to pick one up. And, and what you can do, as soon as you read this, you can go cancel all your insurance policies, and this one has already been paid for. Not, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Now, when I pray, Steve didn't like that at all. <laughs> I don't blame him. Now, when I pray the part of the Lord's Prayer where Jesus instructed us, where he said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You know what I think about there? First of all, I think about the fact that if we'll listen to God, he, when a, a tempting situation comes, if we will listen to the Holy Spirit, he will lead us a way out of it. Uh, Paul said there's always a pathway out of temptation. But not only that, I'm thinking about the 91st Psalm where he says, and deliver us from evil. What we're going to do now is I'm going, to, I'm going to teach you verse by verse what I've learned from this psalm and what I believe to be very, very true. In just a moment, we're going to talk about ten promises in this psalm. But this psalm and its fulfillment in our lives is predicated on two things. Predicated on two things. This is important that you get this. First, position. Our position our position, and secondly, our proclamation. Our proclamation. Both of these require equal attention. And by the way, one will not work without the other. This psalm is loaded with promises. In fact, I've, as I've already stated, there are ten promises in this psalm. And listen, they are all based upon our positioning and our proclamation, our declaration. I want to say that again. These promises are all based upon our positioning, knowing who we are and where we need to be, and our declaration. By the way, did you notice I didn't say on our sinless perfection? Did you notice I didn't say anything about works or anything like that? I said it's based upon our position and our proclamation. Here's verse 1. This is the position that all of us need to take as believers in Christ. It says, He who dwells in the secret place, or as the New Living Translation says, who dwells in the shelter of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, the Hebrew word for dwells, if you define it, it means to sit down in quiet. To sit down in quiet. By implication, it means to dwell are to remain. So whatever you're doing in life, every day, you know, whether you're working, you're going to the store, shopping, uh, sitting at home, whatever you're doing, folks, listen, we're to sit down in God's presence. Everywhere we go, the Holy Spirit is with us. We talked about that last week. There is no place that you go where the Holy Spirit doesn't go with you, and that should kind of make us take a second thought, too. Wow. Think about... Well, this is a side note. What are you watching on TV? The Holy Spirit's there with you, and you don't want him to have to go, oh, mm, wow. We've got awful quiet in here. That, that was, that was, that was kind of a side note there. So where are we to dwell? In the secret place or shelter of the Most High. In other words, we're to dwell in relationship every single day. In fact, every moment of the day with our Father. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 6 and 6. The, the disciples wanted to know how to pray. And so Jesus said, here's what you do. You go into your room. He's talking about your private devotional time with the Lord or wherever that place is. And when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. Where's God at? He's in the secret place. In other words, that secret place, and I'll clarify this again in just a moment, is wherever you meet with the Lord. And folks, listen, if it's possible, I like to meet with the Lord in basically the same place every day. Now, you, sometimes you need to change your prayer time. Sometimes I like to walk and talk to the Lord. But, but it's the place where the Father dwells. He says, and your Father who sees in secret, I love this, will reward you openly, Matthew 6 and 6. 
I like rewards. I'm not going to stand here and imply to you that, oh, I don't want any rewards. Just heaven is enough. And it is. But that's not only what he's talking about. He's talking about he will reward you in the here and now. Listen, the person who makes God their hiding place, if you watch their life over the entirety of their life, listen, you will see that God has openly rewarded them. And by the way, I knew what I was preaching, so I had a little sit down and I talked to the Lord. And I said, now, now Lord, just in case you need a little help or you want to know how I would like to be openly rewarded, here it is. You have not because you ask not. And I said, now, Lord, if some of this is too carnal or if it, it, you see it's best, I don't need this, so be it. Your will be done. But, <laughs> and so we're to pray to our Father who is in the secret place. He says, I'll reward you openly. So we see that the secret place is that place where you meet with the Heavenly Father. Maybe it's in your car on the way to work. I mean, let's don't limit God. You know, I've known of one mother that, in fact, the only place Tracy could find peace and quiet when our kids were little is when she would go in the bathroom and take a long soaking bath. And I'm assuming she would talk to Jesus there. At least that's what she told me she did. How many of you hear what I'm saying? And, and he goes on to say, And you shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. What does this mean? What does it mean to dwell under the shadow? It means that I'm living in close fellowship with the Heavenly Father or the Most High God, our Heavenly Father. Notice, when you pray, he said, pray to the Father, our Father, our Father who art in heaven. Notice, our. I tell you, God has taken all selfishness out of our praying when he said, you're to pray, our Father. Listen, give us. This day our daily bread. Forgive us. So it can't just be you and the Lord. You've got to keep the family in mind. You've got to keep uh, uh, a God's kingdom in mind when you pray. All that's for free, by the way. It means that I'm living in close fellowship with the Heavenly Father of the Most High. Here's how the message words it. It says, You who sit down in the high God's presence... Spend the night in shadows, a shady eyes, a shadow. That's what he's basically saying. You live real close. In fact, I want to give you a picture. If you guys have that picture, I want you to put it on the screen, and hopefully you can see this well. This, listen, this is a picture of a bird that has her little, whatever you want to call them, her little bitty birds under her wings. I saw this once on Facebook. You know, there's some good that comes out of Facebook. I saw this picture, and hopefully you can see it very, very well. This mother is protecting her little chicks, amen? And that's the picture I want you to leave here with today, that when you dwell close to God, God, in fact, we'll read some other verses that confirm this. God is covering you. So this is the position. Turn to somebody next to you and say, this is the position. This is the position that we all need to dwell in. But then next we come to the proclamation. The proclamation, in other words, what I declare. Verse 2 says, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him I will trust. Every time I'm praying or, or thinking about this, I often will pray this. I, I will say it out loud. I say of the Lord, He is my fortress and my refuge, my God in whom I trust. He is the fortress and refuge of my wife and my family and my children and, 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 and the church. He is the one who protects us. Amen? And so once we are positioned, then we begin to declare God's protection in our lives. I pray you listen throughout this whole psalm. I've got some things to say that maybe you hadn't thought about in a while. But really, if you think about these terms, they're, they're really strong terms. Notice it says, He is my refuge. He is my fortress. If you define the word refuge, it means a condition of being safe or sheltered from pursuit, danger, or trouble. I like that. I like that. I like the fact that God is our refuge. Listen to the idea behind a uh, fortress. It, it really, if you go back and study, it is, a, it is a military stronghold. This is the idea behind the word fortress here. A military stronghold. 
A person, listen, here's what it defined. It's defined this way. A person or thing not susceptible to outside influence or disturbances. That's pretty good, isn't it? Isn't that good? You think we need this in the days ahead? Oh, I guarantee you we do. I promise you do. Proclaiming God's word is powerful. It's very powerful. Proclaiming God's word is potent. Folks, listen, I'll talk about it in a little bit. Folks, let me tell you, there, there is a world, an unseen world out there that needs to hear you proclaim God's word. I'm going to explain to you why in just a moment. First of all, you need to be proclaiming God's word instead of the problem. Right? Yeah. If all we do is go around and proclaim the problem, well, I'll, uh, you'll see something in a minute, but I'm going to wait till I've got you really hooked and, and really excited about this psalm before I give you a reality of what some believers are doing to themselves. Now, the, the reason that I'm so big on proclamation is it has the potential to build an unseen wall of protection around our lives, as well as our families, our churches, our businesses. And that's the reason we need to declare God is our protector. By the way, did you know the devil was aware of the hedge of protection around Job's life? I've heard all kinds of sermons about Job and uh, this and that. But here, here's what we do know about Job. Job chapter 1 verse 10. He says, have you not heard? This is where the devil's talking to God. He says, have you not made a hedge around him? Around his household and all around him uh, that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. Now, I'm going to kind of give you a sneak preview. You know what I believe is the protector around us, the wall of protection? I believe it's angels. <gasps> Pastor's getting off on angels. Angelology. Well, not really. Uh, it's biblical, and I'm going to explain that further in just a little bit. You do want to be listening to that. So, we've got, we've got the response of God to these things. The response that God gives to us it is because of our position. We choose to position ourselves under the shelter of the Most High. It's a choice. He, he doesn't make us. He does not make us. It's a choice. And then it's a choice to make proclamation. Here are ten promises that you'll find in this Psalm 91. Promise number one. Verse three says, Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. Now, again, if you think about the illustration of the bird kingdom, maybe as a kid you tried this. Uh, you got a little box and you put some bread under it and you put a stick there to hold that uh, box up and you ran a long string back and you went and hid somewhere and you would hope that that bird would come and start eating some of that and as soon as you felt like the bird was safely in place, you pulled that string, bam! You caught the bird. Any of you, come on now. Y'all are real quiet today. Any of you ever done that? Is that just us old folks that have done that? Now they're, yeah, it's all old folks so far. Some of you say, no, I don't do that, Pastor. I go get a shotgun. Bam! With bird seed. Hello? Well, this was in a more primitive time. By the way, if you've ever, I, I've already alluded to this once, in fact, in the beginning of this series. I don't know if you're familiar with the television show called Alone, and it's, it, it's a survivalist show where they put these people out in the middle of nowhere, they give them just a few items and no food, and they send them out and say, you've got to survive, and the one who survives the longest gets a million dollars, you know, and, and that's pretty good. But I'll tell you what, surviving out in the middle of nowhere uh, takes some skills. And one of the things they do is what I'm telling you. They have ways of ensnaring birds or other things. They, they don't get to carry a shotgun or a rifle with them on this trip. And so they have to catch their own food. It's very interesting to watch. So he, he promises. But here's the second promise as this verse continues. He says, and he will protect you from the perilous pestilence. That's a word we use every day. You call your friends and you say, I've got some pestilence running around my home and, and just wanted to tell you about it, but no, we really don't. But here's, here, here's how you define the word pestilence. It, it says it is something that destroys. Really, it is defined as plague, a plague, a fatal epidemic disease. Now, God's way ahead of us, folks. Does that ring a bell to anyone this morning? You ever heard the term COVID-19 pandemic? 
Well, God says that He's going to protect us if we dwell in the safety of the Most High and we proclaim that He is our fortress and our refuge, that He is going to protect us from all pestilence. I like that. Here's, here's how the New Living Translation says it. It says, For He will rescue you from every trap and protect you from every deadly disease. Isn't that good? Amen. Some of you need to get a little more excited this morning. I, I worked hard to get this message together. I know you're hearing me. Here's, here's, here's promise number three in verse four. It says, He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Again, I, I, I don't have the picture ready here, but you, you, I want you to remember that image of that mother bird sitting on that branch with her two little children right near her. Amen? Again, the New Living Translation says, He will cover you with His feathers. He will shelter you with His wings. His faithful promises are your armor and your protection. There again, I love the terms that God's using here. Armor and protection. Armor. You see pictures of military forces. And you get the picture of uh, uh, this armor that he's talking about. And then promise number four. I love this one. This is a good one. When you position yourself in the Lord and you proclaim who he is and what he's done, you are afforded 24 hour a day coverage. That's pretty good, amen? So even while you're sleeping, I'll show you. Even while you're asleep, God's protecting you. He's protecting your home, provided you're doing the right thing. If you're dwelling there, and if you're proclaiming this, and really, you know, the proclamation, well, I'll tell you, is first of all for us, right? Listen to verse 5. You shall not be afraid of terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day. How many of you see the 24-hour-a-day coverage? You shall not be afraid of terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day. We're talking about 24-hour-a-day coverage here. We're talking about the shelter of God, night and day. Isn't that good? So you can sleep at peace. Some of you don't have to worry about, what, what, what was that sound, honey? What was that sound? I, I heard something. So I heard the door open. Who was that? What was that? You can sleep in peace. Amen? Verse 6 says, Nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness. There it is again. Nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Again, uh, somebody say it with me. 24-hour day coverage. 24-hour day coverage. That's pretty good. From what? From all destructive and harmful attacks. Regardless of the source. Come on, let's, let's encourage everybody. Let's encourage one another, uh, especially as we're in our groups and we're, we're with other believers. Let, let's encourage one another that everything's going to go be okay and not magnify the devil so much. The devil this, the devil that, the devil this, the devil that. I, he does attack I, it, without fail. When Trace and I gear up to do these connect group things, I, I don't know about you, but we have severe attacks that come our way, and they're, and they're real. And we covet your prayers because they come pretty nonstop and they get pretty thick and heavy and they wear you down if you don't have people praying for you. So whatever the source, guess what? You have protection. Again, here's the New Living Translation. It says, Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night or the arrow that flies in the day. Verse 6. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Folks, whenever there's something going around, do me a favor. Don't tell me about it. <laughs> Haven't you heard, Pastor, what's going around? Oh, we got quiet again. We do that. Oh, you haven't heard? No, I haven't heard, and I don't want to heard. Right? Uh, we need to work on these things, church. Now, this is really good. Here, th th this is one of my favorite. Promise number five. A thousand, uh, verse seven. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand. Listen, but it shall not come near you. Shall not come near you. 
There, there's, no, there's no but to it. Don's got his hanky out waving. Thank God. It, it won't come near your dwelling. Now, folks, we, we, listen, we, we, we've been going through this and the COVID-19, the pandemic. It, it's time we get our faith back. It's time we get our position back. It's time we get our proclamation back. Can I hear a good amen on that? Yeah. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right side, but it shall not come nigh near your dwelling. I would encourage you to get to know this psalm well. And when things are going around and a sister so-and-so said, Have you heard? Just quote this. Well, it ain't going to come near me and my children. Amen? As, as far as I know... I don't know of one person in this church that directly died of COVID-19. Not one person. Now, we may have had a few who had a lot of ailments and a lot of sicknesses going on, and they tagged it later. He had or she had COVID-19. But as far as I know, and I told somebody that one day, and they were utterly amazed. I believe it's because we understand these things. It scares me when you get quiet. I got so excited, I forgot where I was at. Here, here's verse 8. Let me read verse 8 to you. It says, Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Here it is out of the message, verses 7 and 8. It says, Even though others succumb all around, drop like flies right and left, no harm will even graze you. Verse 8 says, You'll stand untouched, watched it all from a distance, Watch the wicked turn into corpse. A lot of these things the righteous have protection from if we just walk in it. And remind each other, hey, you got to get in position. Are you positioned with the Lord? Here's promise number six. Another amazing promise. Because you have made... The Lord, who is my refuge, our shelter, even the Most High, your dwelling place. Here's the promise, verse 10. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. The word evil defined in the Hebrew is affliction, bad, calamity, distress, or grief. Sounds like to me that God is a good God and wants to protect us and watch over us, amen? He may not take us out of every situation. Right? We may have to go through a few things before God wraps this thing up. But I can tell you this, He's, he's going to keep us from affliction, from bad things, from calamity, from distress, and even grief. Now here, I want you to really listen up. If, if for some reason you say, okay, I've heard enough, I'm in great shape, I'm going to do this. No, you need to listen to this. Here's promise number seven. In verse 11, it says, For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in some of your ways. No, it says, He'll keep you in all of your ways. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, what? In all your ways. Now, I want to say something to you. I think I've already kind of alluded to it, and this is good. I, I, I believe in angels. And I believe that angels have so much to do with our dwelling safely. I really do. I believe, I believe they protect us. In fact, I'll probably say this again. I think everyone who is a believer has a guardian angel. I believe that. Now, I believe they have so much to do with our dwelling safely. In fact, I, I believe, as I've said, Christians have a guardian angel. Now, some of God's children's angels are busier than others. Yeah. Yeah. So, I am a firm believer in angels, and I also believe that angels protect and watch over us. And, and by the way, when you think about this, I think only eternity will reveal how many times we have been uh, protected from harm and dangerous situations. Can I just brag on the Lord a little bit? I was out for my daily walk, uh, this week, and I have a neighbor who lives kind of behind us. He's got a, we've got a side road, and he lives there. And, and, and I, I, I kind of know his car, and I heard him coming. Uh, and so I was on my side, the proper side where I'm going to be walking. He's in the right lane, and he's, he's getting close to me. And all of a sudden, 
I don't think the car behind him saw me because their view was blocked. And so this car decides to come around him, and I'm right over. This is, this is not a highway or a road that has side areas on it. You have to kind of walk on the line as you're going. You have to stay awake. And he honked his horn. And I looked back, and I realized, whoa, I stepped out of the way. This car was passing. They weren't seeing me. They were trying to get around him because he was going too slow. What they didn't realize, he was about to make a left-hand turn. Plus, he drives real slow going down the road. But he alerted me, and as I looked back, I saw this car. And here I am. So I jumped out of the way. Those are the kind of things I encountered during a Connect Group campaign. Listen, I was coming to church last Wednesday evening... And, uh, or actually, I was coming home. No, I was going, I was coming to church Wednesday evening. And I've just turned out, and I'm on 182, and I'm, I'm praising the Lord. I try to always just get into worship mode, come into church. And, and I'm going up this hill, and there's a car way in front of me, or a truck or something. And that, that car has crested the hill that I'm headed to. I'm down in the low bottom area. And I see this other car, and I hope it was none of you, in a little red uh, Toyota Rob, one of those little small hatchback Toyotas. And I'm sitting there looking, I'm like, this car, I could see this person's face. The sun was bright enough still that I could see their face, and I could see that they were looking in their rear view mirror at something, and as they were doing this, they're drifting over and over and over. Thankfully, I saw it. And by the time this was over, I'm partially in the ditch missing them. I saw it. And their, their wheel is over in my lane on the first side where your, wheel, your left wheel would go. Their left wheel was over like this. I believe God protected me and watched over me and alerted me to that. Right? You've had those experiences. Don't, don't, don't take credit for it and say, wow, that was close. I did good there. I, I, I was doing some good driving, wasn't I? Well, the Lord helped you. And I believe those things happen all the time. I, I, I don't want to take too much more of the time. But I always pray when we go somewhere, Lord, if you need to slow us up just a little bit, or speed us up, or change our path, I, I want to come home better than when I leave today. I don't want to be in an accident. I don't want to be wrecked, and then I'll claim some of this. And, and the Lord honors that. Amen? And the other day, one little note, and then I'll move on. The other day, Trace and I, it was Friday. Friday afternoon, the weather was great. We had just a little time, and I, the light went off. And I said, honey, we need to get on the bike. We need to go somewhere and, and eat a meal. Well, I'm waiting. Trace has to come into town to get some things, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting. And I know I'm not very often very unspiritual, but occasionally. And I was like, I, I'm getting a little impatient here. Where, where is Trace at? Where is Tracy at? Where are you at, Tracy? And I'm kind of, I've got on my Harley gear, and it gets a little hot when you're just sitting there. And uh, I heard the Lord all of a sudden say, I thought you wanted me to slow you up on occasions to keep you safe. I said, praise the Lord. <laughs> Instead of giving Tracy that look when she came in the driveway, that, you know, that look like, I got my eye on you, girl. I just, hello, Tracy. I got a confession to make. That was after I called her on the phone and said, where you at, girl? <laughs> but that's when the Lord said that. He said, I thought you wanted me to slow, slow you up or speed you up. I said, okay, Lord. I, I, I received an attitude adjustment there. <laughs> right? Now listen very carefully. Listen. I also believe that angels can be activated to serve on our behalf or they can be deactivated. Activated or deactivated. This, this, is, this is good. Psalm 103 verse 20 says, Bless the Lord, you His angels, who excel in strength, who do His word, heeding the voice of His word. Angels respond to the spoken word. It's a reason quoting the Bible in prayer or in situations is absolutely powerful. 
They, they do His Word. They heed the voice of His Word. That's one of the reasons I speak good things. I speak Scripture, and I do speak over travels and other things. Angels respond to the spoken Word, and uh, this is what we know. They're continually in the presence of the Word. That, that's, that's all they know. Listen now. Don't get, don't get, don't get angry. Don't get mad. But their hands are tied when we continually utter negative words that are not in agreement with God's Word. Now we need to grasp that as Christians. I'm not saying you can't ever come to a friend and say, Hey, my rheumatism's cutting up. I need a little help here. I'm having a problem. Uh, and get some prayer. But folks, when I say, how you doing? I don't want to hear every medical problem you've got. Glory, I had to get that out. I empathize with you. I understand it. My physician, we were talking about this one day, and he, he listen, I'm not trying to shame you, but what I'm trying to do is get our faith up. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get us positioned here and get us in a safe zone. That's what I'm trying to do. But my physician, I'm getting to know him better and better, and he opens up to me, and I'm opening up to him. But he told me, he said, you know, David, it seems like now when I go to church, you, you greet your friends or, and, and, and some of your members that go to your church, you ask them how you're doing, and they just list all their problems and all their ailments. This is a physician who said this. They do this to the doctor. I said, well, it's not just the doctor. They do it to the preacher. Now, folks, listen, I don't mind you telling me if you need prayer about something. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm telling you is our greeting should not be all negative, down, and all that. Come on. It's good preaching. In fact, let me just tell you what I believe. I'll probably lose a half dozen people after this, but i got to say, here, here, here's the other side of this. I believe if we say uh, words that are not uh, in God's will, we, we uh, invite demon forces to respond to our work. In other words, we give them access to our lives. I told you, that's the reason I waited to talk about angels a little later. It does matter what we say. James tells us our lives are set on fire uh, by hell, by the words that we say. He says, our tongue is like a big or a rudder on a ship. It guides that ship. Or the bits that you put in a horse's mouth. And if we're constantly talking down, 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 negative, 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 negative. First of all, you're not going to have too many friends. Right? Now, again, I want this balance. I don't want you to think, well, boy, I can't ever tell pastor anything that's going on in my life. Yes, you can. But I'm talking about just casual, not thinking about what we're saying. I believe angels can be activated or deactivated. If you'll say amen, I'll move on. Now, here, here, here's the balance to all of this. Uh, and by the way, this includes our communities. Includes our families, our church. People just say things about churches today and do not think a thing about man. They, you know, they'll they'll say anything just so they don't have to be committed. Don't be cursing God's house. Don't be cursing the church. But here's what I want to say. Here's the balance. All this. Don't focus on angels. Don't focus on angels. We're not to focus on angels. Focus on God's word. Now that's 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 a real balance presentation of this. Verse 12 says, In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. The Living Bible says they will steady you with their hands to keep you from stumbling against the rocks on the trail. But then he tells us about our authority. Folks, Christians have authority that very few people use. He says in verse 13, You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent, you shall trample underfoot. In other words, you have authority over these things. These are often, uh, they were literal in their time, but they are also symbolic. Jesus said it this way. 
in Luke 19, or, or Luke 10, verse 19, he says, Behold, he's talking to his children, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions, which are symbols of evil, and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. I'd be standing up, hoping it up just a little bit. Woo! Amen? Folks, we have authority and it's time we use it. Right? It's time we use it. The message says it this way. It says, you'll walk unharmed among lions and snakes and kick young lions and serpents from the path. Now, people literally in this time and day in which David's age, they had to deal with these things. And God was telling them, you have literal authority over these physical things. Don't, don't let them keep you from doing what you need to do. And then promise number 8, verse 14, it says, Because he set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. It doesn't stop there. It says, I will set him on high because he knows my name. The Living Bible says it this way. For the Lord says, because he loves me, I will rescue. I will make him great because he trusts in my name. I'll take some greatness. I'll take some greatness. Amen? And then promise number 9, verse 15. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him, and I will be with him in trouble, and deliver him, and honor him. Amen. Come on, folks. It's okay. If God wants to honor you, and give you a place of influence... And power. Why don't you use it for His glory? Because honor means this. Numerous. Rich. Uh, to make weighty. This speaks of influence and prosperity. I have no intentions of going broke in the days ahead. <gasps> Preacher. What you, you shouldn't even talk about those things. I have no intentions of going broke in the days ahead. How about you? Well, three of you aren't. I'm going to keep believing God. I'm going to keep believing that as I seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, everything I need is going to be added unto me. He didn't say post-pandemic. He didn't say, uh, you know, all these other things that are going on. He's going to honor us. Folks, God can stretch your money. See, some of you start arguing with me there. You're like, well, you, you just don't know, Pastor. You, 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 I mean, I mean, don't argue with me. I'm telling you what the Bible says. Don't get down and argue with me. You take it up with the Lord. And then the final promise, number 10. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. If I'm going to be alive, I want to live a long life. I want to be satisfied in Him. And I want Him to show me my salvation. Amen. Now, folks, these are some pretty amazing promises. This psalm is chock full of promises. But it all begins with properly positioning ourselves. You must position yourself. And then you must make your proclamation or declaration from that place of position. So I've got three questions for you based upon everything I've said. Are you dwelling in the secret place? Come on, if you're not, get there. If you're not, get back there. If you've gotten distracted, get back to that dwelling place. Are you sitting in God's presence consistently and regularly? And what are you saying to the Lord over your life every day. What are you saying? Well, we need to speak God's Word. Would you mind if I prayed for you? Father, we want to thank you for this outstanding psalm, Lord. Thank you for the promises, these ten promises that we find in Psalm 91. God, if we've gotten off track, if we've, we've forgotten who we are and we're not positioned in you, Lord, help us to return to that place of position and, Lord, proclamation. Father, if we've gotten in a bad habit of, uh, of negative speaking and negative talking, Lord, I pray, God, you'll help us with our speech, 
that, Lord, we'll get back to that place we need to be. And, Father, as we speak, I believe it increases faith in our hearts. So we thank you for protection, Lord, in these crazy days. And everybody said, just a few final thoughts. I believe that in these crazy days ahead, God will protect you and your family, your business. I believe He's going to protect our church if we will position ourselves and proclaim what God says about us. Amen.